Hello, everyone. Welcome to Episode 8 of our RSVP Connections webinar series. Uh, my name is Rose Clark. I am a Conservation Corps uh, member serving an AmeriCorps term with the Regional Sustainable Development Partnerships. Um, the, the partnerships are part of the University of Minnesota Extension, and the, they exist to um, support community-driven sustainability projects in the regions of Greater Minnesota. Um, so I live here in Northwest, but I work with the natural resources groups of Northwest, Northeast, Central, Southwest, and Southeast. Um, in that natural resources capacity, I help to um, kind of cross-pollinate ideas, um, share resources, and um, assist them with whatever they need to be most effective and successful in your, their communities. Uh, so this webinar series kind of grew out of that position. Um, as a way of sharing with work group members who are mostly volunteers um, what's going on on the university side of things uh, so that they know for themselves and they can share it with their community partners. Um, today we have with us to present uh, Karen Oberhauser. She's a University of Minnesota professor and extension specialist. Um, she helps to lead the Monarch Lab on the St. Paul campus. Um, and then we also have Alicia Kenny. She is a community collaborator. Uh, she has helped to found the Sustainable Sheep and Fiber Community up here in Northwest Minnesota um, and worked with the partnerships, Linda Kingery and the Northwest Partnerships to, to get that started. Um, so a few things about our program here. We're hosting today's webinar through WebEx. If you are Looking on our slides on a computer, uh, you'll be able to see what we're talking about. <laughs> if you are just calling in on your phone, um, let me know. If you have any questions, you can email me at rmclark, C-L-A-R-K-E, at umn.edu. Um, if you are joining us on a computer, you can submit questions via the chat box in the right-hand side of your screen, um, and you can send that to um, either the host or all attendees, all participants. Um, that'll get to me, and I will help to kind of facilitate questions to the presenters um, after they share their bit. Um, we are recording today's session, so it will be available to view later um, on our RSDP YouTube page or on our webinar home site. Um, you can uh, check back and watch it again or share it with others that time. Uh, well, at the end of the session, we'll also have a short poll, so be looking for that. Uh, it helps me to get feedback for future webinars and, um, and my Conservation Corps position as well. So with that, I think that I've covered everything I need to. Um, we're going to start today's webinar with Karen Oberhauser. Uh, Karen is a professor and extension specialist in the Department of Fisheries, Wildlife, and Conservation Biology of the University of Minnesota. She is a key figure in the international community of monarch butterfly research and conservation education. And as I said before, her lab is based on the St. Paul campus. I was lucky enough to have a little tour of it one time when I was there, and it is a caterpillar-filled happening place. Um, so Karen, do you want to go ahead and kick us off? Sure. Um, let's see. I'm not sure you've given me sharing privileges, Rose. When I yeah, click on, okay. You. Now, okay. Now I can share my screen. And all right. So awesome. is this working? Okay. Can you yeah. everybody see it? Can you see it, Rose? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So this is always weird um, talking on a webinar because I can't see the audience. Um, I do a lot of talks for audiences that I can see, but. Um, like Rose said, you can be a little interactive with this format by using the chat box, which I can't see right now, but hopefully everybody else can. Um, so I'm really excited to be here talking with you today. Um, what I'm going to talk about is how you can use monarch butterflies as a tool for community engagement. And I'm going to give you a little background on monarch butterfly biology, and then for most of my few minutes here, um, talk about how you can be involved with monarchs um, with whatever audiences you're working with, whether it's your kids or neighbors or if, or if you work with broader groups. Um, 
And when I talk about being involved with audiences, I'm going to focus on two things. One is through citizen science, and one is through conservation work. Um, and with the conservation work, I'm going to focus on the Monarch Joint Venture, which is a University of Minnesota, or it's, it's a program that's fiscally and physically funded at the University of Minnesota, but has um, partners from all over the United States. And then I'll end by sharing some resources. Um, um, some links that you can use to get resources that I've talked about. But I guess that this will be um, archived, so you'll be able to see this presentation again. So first of all, you know, there are over a million species of insects in the world, and why do we care so much about monarch butterflies? I think monarchs are a really great organism for linking together scientists, um, people interested in conservation, and just ordinary citizens. They have an amazing biology. They're super charismatic, um, and they're, they're familiar. So people have seen them. Um, a lot of kids raise them in their classrooms, as you can see with these kids down in the corner here. Um, they're involved with citizen science, like through this tag butterfly up here. And um, people are involved monitoring monarch populations throughout the summer. Um, so there really are a lot of opportunities to be involved with monarch butterflies. And just a little bit of background, um, and I guess I can't answer questions while I'm talking here, but feel free to ask me questions about this. Um, they have this amazing annual cycle, uh, the migratory cycle, and I'm starting on this slide with what they're doing right now. So monarchs from all over this region of the United States and southern Canada are flying down um, south, heading through Mexico, where they're going to funnel into Mexico and go to overwintering spots in the center of Mexico. There's a fairly separate population along the western coast of the United States. Butterflies from here, for the most part, migrate to sites along the coast of California. But a few of them from this population we know from tag butterflies um, can fly from Arizona to the overwintering sites in Mexico. So we have this incredible fall migration. The butterflies get to their overwintering sites in California and Mexico early in November, stay there through March, and then those very same butterflies, <laughs> this yellow arrow represents the winter, um, these very same butterflies migrate out of these sites um, back into the United States in the case of the eastern population. They cover this whole area in the southeastern part of the United States, and then their offspring are the ones that migrate back into their northern breeding range. And we have a similar thing going on with the California butterflies. There just aren't, they just don't cover quite as big an area. And then they go through two to three non-migratory generations up here in their northern breeding range. We're just ending um, with that right now. There's still a few eggs and caterpillars out there, but not very many. And then the cycle starts again. So that's, that's what we call the annual cycle that has these four parts migrating south, overwintering, migrating north, and breeding. And we can put some pictures to this, kind of thinking about what monarchs need along the, or during this migratory cycle. Um, when they're migrating south in the fall, they need, most importantly, sources of nectar. So um, this is an ironweed plant in my front yard, and here we have a female monarch butterfly um, nectaring on this ironweed, and she's in the migratory generation. Um, so, you know, this is one thing we can really need to provide for them is nectar sources during the fall. They also roost at night. They don't fly during the night. So this is a picture taken on a mesquite tree in Texas um, as they're migrating through Texas in the fall. And I love this picture because you can see this butterfly flying in to join its buddies um, on that branch. When they get to Mexico, their job is mostly to stay alive. So for the most part, they hang out on trees um, in in um, forest in central Mexico. Um, there's their oyamel fir trees. You can just kind of see in this picture, uh, excuse my arrow, um, you can just see these little um, needles from the fir tree peeking through here. Um, but for the most part, they just hang out and, and try to stay alive. Um, sometimes you do see a lot of flight, but they're usually just sitting and saving their energy. As they're migrating north in the spring, they need, again, nectar sources for the adults. So um, native plants are good, but so are non-native plants. So here's a picture of a lilac, which is a great nectar resource for monarchs in the springtime. Um, 
They are moving north basically with the milkweed. This is a milkweed plant in Oklahoma, and that female has spent the winter in Mexico and is now laying an egg in Oklahoma. And then when they get up here for the summertime, um, this is when the population really grows. So again, they need the milkweed. This is a swamp, this female is laying an egg on a swamp milkweed plant, and the nectar resources again. Um, and here you can see a, a female butterfly again on black-eyed Susan, and then the cycle starts again. So this is a chain, and we all know that a chain is only as strong as the weakest link. But every time I go to Mexico and look at these monarchs sitting in the trees, I think that every single one of those monarchs has an amazing story, and every single one of those stories started on a milkweed plant, most of them up here in the breeding range. So this is why what we do in Minnesota is so important to monarchs because we're, we're the base for this whole story. Um, so one of the reasons that we're so involved with conservation of monarchs is that the population is declining. And you can see from this graph, which shows you the area that they occupy in Mexico in hectares. So this is basically the area that's covered with trees that are covered with monarchs. And they, the trees literally are covered with monarchs. And you can see that we had a peak in 1996 where we got up to 18 hectares. A hectare is about two and a half acres, just to give you a sense with numbers you're more familiar with. So this is kind of around 40 acres or so of you know trees covered with monarchs. And that number has been declining. We had a little uptick last winter, but unfortunately there was a storm that killed a lot of those butterflies. So we see a steep decline in the number of monarchs that we're sending down to Mexico every year. So people can really be involved in helping this population. Um, in the United States, people can plant um, plant resources. So this is a garden. This is a school in Rochester, Minnesota. Um, kids are working in Mexico to help plant the trees in the forest. Um, people are involved in citizen science. Here are some um, students and youth and parents involved in a project um, looking at the density of monarch eggs and caterpillars. So there's a lot of ways that we can be involved to help monarchs. So now I'm going to kind of switch and be a little more focused here on ways that, that you might want to be involved with whatever audiences you're working with and, and switch to talking about um, using monarchs um, with students and also all the different citizen science projects. So if you're not familiar with citizen science, um, citizen science is, is kind of a new and growing thing. Um, citizen science projects are ones in which volunteers who are, for the most part, not professional scientists, or not, at least not professional scientists in the area in which they're collecting the data, get involved with scientific projects by collecting data as part of organized scientific research. Um, and this is, I don't mean to kind of brag, but it was actually really exciting for me. Um, I got to go to the White House as part of a panel, um, and, and this is just illustrating that um, people at very high levels in the United States government are really in, in, um, interested in the power of citizen science as a scientific and an educational tool. So that was a pretty fun experience to go there. Um, for monarchs, we have all sorts of projects, and I know that this is a really messy slide with a lot of words, but the point is not what all the words are over on the right here. Um, the point is that there are so many projects where citizen scientists are collecting data, either about monarchs in particular, like the one we run at the University of Minnesota, or about butterflies in general. So here's one on the top, the North American Butterfly Association. So, these projects cover monarchs over all stages of that annual cycle, which is, is really exciting and gives a lot of opportunities for involvement. And I'm going to give you a link at the end where you can find out about all these projects. Um, and this is just one of the projects. Um, and I love this one because it's so visual. This is a project called Journey North, which actually was started in Minnesota. But this is showing the movement of monarchs as they're coming north in the springtime. And each one of the dots, so this is this year, each one of the dots on this map, so you can just look at one of these dots, that is one person who saw one monarch, and it's the first monarch that they saw in the spring, and they reported it to this website. 
So here we can see the monarchs um, by the dates as they're moving north. So all these monarchs that you're seeing right now are the ones that are moving north out of Mexico. And then starting about now, we're getting the second generation. So the pink and the red colors are the second generation moving north um, into our region. So citizen scientists are really helping us understand monarchs. So um, thanks to all of these projects that I just listed, um, we understand many, many things about monarchs. Um, we understand how weather events or different human activities affect monarchs, potential impacts of climate change on monarchs, the habitat types that are important during the migration, um, how we can best manage migratory stopover sites like the one that I showed you in that slide with the butterflies on the mesquite trees in Texas. So we've really learned a lot about how we can best conserve monarchs. And, and as you can see from this slide of a junior high girl, um, people have a lot of fun collecting these data for us as well. And we've also learned that engaging in citizen science projects about monarchs and other organisms as well promotes conservation action. So the people that are involved in these projects are likely to be involved in things that will help the organisms that they're studying. And this conservation can be in the areas of habitat enhancement, so letting, here's a great picture of somebody's backyard with a lot of milkweed growing in it, um, this another backyard that has um, nectar plants for the monarchs. And if you plant it, they'll come. And I can attest to that as I was walking into work, there were six monarchs. Um, in my front yard this morning, so you know that gives me great pleasure to see them in the morning. Um, it also gets people involved with, especially working with youth. Um, these are pictures of a group of students that are monitoring a site up in Duluth, Minnesota, um, and they put up a sign at this site. Um, here's a little sign that they made that shows that this is a monarch larva monitoring project site, and they put up information about monarch butterflies. So lots of ways that being involved in citizen science gets people more involved in conservation in general. Um, we've also done a lot of work at the University of Minnesota using citizen science as a tool to get students more involved with science research in general. And what we've learned that if we use the biology, for example, in this case, the biology of monarchs to help students build their knowledge of the natural world. They get to contribute data to a citizen science project, so they're really learning about the value of citizen science and, and data and how to manage data. And then they can take it a step further and conduct their own investigations about monarchs or other things. So all of these pictures are taken of students in Minnesota that are involved with citizen science and working with teachers or parents or other people to help them kind of take it the next step with the goal of conducting their own investigations. Um, we've developed some curriculum guides that you'd be welcome to use. Again, I'll give you um, a way to download these. So this is a um, facilitator's guide, which would be for adults that are working with youth um, working on citizen science, and then this is a guide that we've developed for kids to use. So um, we've developed materials that are available free for download, and we do have hard copies here too. Um, we're doing a lot of training, so if you or, know, or you know people who are teachers, um, we have summer workshops on the University of Minnesota campus where teachers come, get to practice this, learn the content, and then talk about how they're going to transfer this information to their students. And we also do a lot of school year follow through with the teachers. And we have teachers from all over Minnesota and actually we have some from surrounding states as well involved in our programs. So here you can see um, the teachers out collecting data. They're actually watching bees in this picture. Um, we take them to a lot of different places. Um, this, this picture was actually taken at a workshop we gave in Illinois, but kind of shows it's really, you know, we do a lot of small group work. Um, and then the goal, of course, is to get students involved with monarchs in many, many different ways. Um, and I, I just love this picture. This was a kid that came to our um, research fair a couple years ago, and, and this was 
the result of his work with this project, and I'm just going to read it because I just love it so much. He says, we give him this prompt, I am a scientist because, but then we didn't prompt the rest of this. And this is what he wrote, science is fun. Science makes you interactive with the world around you. It's better to see things in real life than just seeing it on a board or TV. Just think, would you rather sit down and experience nothing or go out and reach the boundaries of your brain? So that's just a great example of um, how getting kids involved with this stuff um, excites them about science. So wonderful. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a really great picture. Um, so again, I'm going to switch gears um, and end by talking about our work with the Monarch Joint Venture um, and what we're doing with conservation and, and how you could engage yourselves or audiences with Monarch Conservation. So the Monarch Joint Venture is a big organization. We have more than 50 partner organizations at this part, and you can see it at this point. And you can see from this slide, this is everywhere from um, big federal agencies like the Forest Service and the Fish and Wildlife Service um, to state agencies. Um, let's see, we have yeah, the Minnesota DNR is part of this. The Iowa DNR, I'm not finding them. Texas Parks and Wildlife um, to little. Um, nonprofit organizations that are very localized or, or national um, nonprofit organizations like Wild, Wild Ones or the Xerces Society. So lots and lots of organism, organizations involved with this. And our goals are habitat conservation in big areas. So here's a CRP field um, along roadsides and at schools um, with the, the focus getting milkweed into these habitats and nectar plants for adult monarchs. Um, we work, we have a lot of education and outreach materials, um, kind of materials to help you if you're, if you want resources for planting um, school gardens with kids, resources for getting kids involved with citizen science. We do trainings for adults, so getting them involved with citizen science and then a lot of, of um, just informational materials. Um, at these workshops that I talked about, um, we, we go out um, and basically our goal is to teach people about monarch biology, um, conservation, and monitoring. So we, we do a lot of work out, out in the field with people. We've been doing for several years um, what we are calling North American Monarch Institutes for educators, and these are for both classroom teachers and um, educators at nature centers and other places. So basically just teaching about monarch biology and conservation. We've had over 800 educators take part in these from all through North America, and we've done them in a lot of different places. And we've really focused on engaging urban audiences through this, so getting, getting kids in urban areas involved and outside. So some of the resources um, we have for you, so I'm, I'm kind of separating this into different um, slides. So if you're interested in conservation action and resources that can help you there, here's a link to the Monarch Joint Venture website, just monarchjointventure.org. Um, we have information there on the basics of conservation, um, actions that you can take part in. If you have some monarch habitat, we have a map where you can add a little point on the map that tells your story with monarch habitat, um, links to all of our partners. We have news that goes out, out sporadically, and anybody in the country um, can sign up to get updates on monarch conservation. Um, it's really easy on the website to sign up for those updates. A lot of information on planting milkweed and creating habitat and, and a lot more. So that's one set of resources that we have for you. Um, we have all of these handouts at this website, so um, really concise fact sheets. Here's a, one on milkweed information, one on the Monarch Joint Venture itself, one on the best timing of mowing. Um, for roadside management, gardening for monarchs. We have about a dozen of these, and most of them have been translated into Spanish. Um, for education resources, um, this is a link to our University of Minnesota Monarch Lab website, monarchlab.org. 
This has a whole bunch of um, lessons and activities that can be done both indoors and outdoors. Um, this is where you can go to get our curriculum guides and, and other curriculum information and information on our workshops and classes for both adults and youth. So that's the Monarch Lab website. And then um, if you're interested in citizen science, um, we, one of the Monarch Joint Venture fact sheets is on citizen science. So this is downloadable from the Monarch Joint Venture website. But these are what we call the, the big four citizen science projects about monarchs out of that whole list. Um, so if you're interested in individual projects, this one, the MLMP.org is ours at the University of Minnesota Monarch, Lab, Monarch Larva Monitoring Project, if you want interested in looking for monarch eggs and adults, or monarch eggs and larvae, sorry. Um, there's one on a parasite checking monarch adults for a parasite called OE, that's monarchparasites.org. Um, the one that I showed you the map of where the monarchs were migrating north is Journey North. So here's the website for that one. And if you're interested in tagging monarchs during the fall, that would be Monarch Watch. So that's monarchwatch.org. And we also have kind of a, a home for all monarch websites, and that's monarchnet, just MN for monarchnet, butterfliesandmoths.org. So I just want to end by saying that, you know, why monarchs? I said in the beginning there are over a million species of insects in the world, and, you know, a lot of them we've never even discovered, but a lot of them are, are fairly common. And why monarchs? Why, why do I spend my life focusing on monarch conservation? And there are several reasons, um, and hopefully some of these will resonate for you and, and make you want to get involved with some of this work. Um, Importantly, monarchs exist in this really interesting mosaic of rare and pristine habitats. So we find monarchs in native prairies, which are one of the most endangered ecosystems in the United States. And, you know, in Minnesota, we're lucky enough to have some native prairies left, but that's, they're incredibly rare habitats. But they also occur in really common and disturbed habitats, like you can find milkweed growing up in a crack in your sidewalk, and, and a female monarch might find milkweed and lay her eggs on that. Um, so when we save these habitats for monarchs, um, we're saving them for a lot of other species as well. Um, monarchs are familiar. Um, they're well-loved. Um, I don't think I've ever met anyone who didn't like monarchs, even though they might not like a lot of other kinds of insects. And as I've tried to convey here, they provide a really excellent focus for citizen science, for science education, and getting people involved in conservation. And finally, they require this big continental conservation effort, coordination. And this is something that can really um, make people understand the connectedness of, of different places on the planet and how we really need to all work together to preserve these amazing resources. So with that, I'm going to end um, and just thank all the people that I've worked with, um, the citizen scientists and, and other people um, that have been so important, and, and then to, to the governments in Mexico, the United States, and Canada, and all the individual agencies who are, who are working to protect monarchs. So that is um, my presentation, and I wish I could see all of you out there, but um, I think that Rose is now going to... Are you going to coordinate questions, Rose? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Karen. Those are wonderful resources. And I think a lot of people are very excited um, about the impact that education can have. You know, um, an individual project doing restoration or, or uh, just in a, an individual site, it has its limitations. But I was talking to a group in Southeast, um, the natural resources group there, and they were talking about the potential of you know, how many people you can reach with these educational materials, and, and um, so that's really wonderful. Um, we had a couple questions. Um, number one, how, how do you tell that the butterfly that you saw in your front yard was female? What's the, what's the difference? Um, here, I, I can actually use this slide right here. So if you look on, on this butterfly right here that's on the flowers, frostweed in, in Texas, 
Um, if you look at this vein, can you see my pointer on the on the side? Yep. yep. Okay. So this vein right here has kind of a widening on it, and only the males have that widening. So it's a little hard to tell at this angle. If if I had it straight on, it would look more like a dot, but I can tell it from here that it's kind of wider. It's not a straight line, and that's a male, and I could see that the butterfly in my front yard didn't have that. Nice. So that's how I can tell. Thank you. Um, the sure. other question we got was um, how many how many milkweed plants uh, make a good site for observation? Um, you know, if you want to be part of a citizen science program and want to kind of foster your own butterfly nursery. Sure, that's that's a really good question. And um, because there is so much mortality, um, there. We, we've estimated from citizen science data and other ways that only about 2 to 5 percent of monarchs make it to become an adult. So out of 100 eggs, you're going to get 2 to 5 adult butterflies. So, um, you know, you can, and the other, and because of that, we, you're not, you're never going to see, you know, all of the milkweed plants in an area overrun with monarchs. So on average, um, out of 30 milkweed plants, you'll get about one adult monarch, and that's because of all the mortality, because females might not find those plants, um, and, because, and also because they eat the milkweed leaves. So, um, you know, that's kind of a really rough number. So, you know, if you have 30 plants, um, you, you might get, say, 100 eggs laid on those in the summertime, but maybe only one or two monarchs will come off of those, you know, you'll only get a few coming up. So the more the better. Um, in our monitoring project, the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project, um, we recommend that people have over a dozen or so plants. Um, some people monitor 300 or even more. But um, it's, yeah, the more the better, but a dozen works. Great. <clears throat> One last question. I, the supplies, because we were talking about the State Fair, and I saw that they had a butterfly house where they were selling um, butterflies or, or um, you know, caterpillars. Uh, Margot asks, does captive rearing affect migration and population levels? Um, that is a really good question, and it's one that I think about all the time. Um, so there is, uh, there's the State Fair project, but there are a lot of other people who rear monarchs to sell them. In fact, we used to do that at the University of Minnesota, but we quit doing it about eight or nine years ago when um, the population really was crashing. Um, it's, it's, there is value in it. Um, there's value in the educational, you know, people buying those monarchs at the fair and um, and you know, learning about them and getting connected to them. But for a lot of reasons, and I'll summarize them quickly, um, one is it's really hard to rear monarchs in a healthy way, that you, you get a lot of disease transmitted through the kind of rearing that they do at the fair, just because there are so many of them and it's so easy to transmit diseases. So um, it's not that healthy for the monarchs. Um, another problem is when you rear any organi organism, Generation after generation in captivity, they, you, natural selection takes place, and um, they start getting selected to do well in captive conditions, and we don't know how well they'll do in the wild. Um, a third reason is they're often released at times, that, at times and places where monarchs wouldn't normally be. And that can be bad for the individual monarchs, but it also complicates our ability to understand the monarch migration. If we can't know that when we see a monarch, it got there naturally. Um, so there have been a lot of cases where we've seen monarchs in an unusual place at an unusual time. That could tell us a lot about monarchs, but we can't trust the observation because it could have been a released monarch. So I don't recommend the practice. Um, you know, I, I, it kind of makes me sad. I, I mean, one thing, when we used to rear them here and people would call us all the time and say, I bought a monarch from you at the State Fair and it died, um, we, that we were never involved with the, with 
the project at the state fair, but people thought we were involved with it. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, you know, it's just not good for them to be carried around all day at the fair, and, they, you know, they go on rides. And, oh, um, no. <laughs> so I don't recommend that practice. Yeah. Well, thank you. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Um, we'll have, you know, feel free to keep sending in questions in the chat box if you're, if you're listening in. Um, yeah, now I'll be able to see it. So I can answer yeah. questions too in the chat box. Yeah. yeah, we'll kind of come back at the end for a final round of questions. So if you have more for Karen, keep sending them in. Um, we're going to transition now into Alethea's presentation. I'm going to transfer presenter privileges. Um, so Alethea Kenny is a natural health professional and the owner of Redbird Farm in Shelvin, Minnesota, where among other things she raises Icelandic sheep. Uh, she championed the founding of the Northwest Minnesota Sustainable Sheep and Fiber Community in February of this year with support from the Northwest RSDP and the Sustainable Farming Association. So, Alicia, go ahead and um, tell us more about the SSSC. Okay. Uh, thank you, Rose. I hope you can hear me, and I hope you can see my slide. Yes, it all, it all checks out. You're good. Okay. Well, thank you so much for hosting this, Rose, and um, to the RSDP for the opportunity to not only get this project off the ground, but to help promote this through webinars and other resources. Um, the sustainable sheep and fiber community is something that uh, actually started <laughs> like three years ago, uh, four years ago, I had attended a sheep event that Jim stored all with the extension had organized, and I came away from that thinking, you know, this is a good event, but I feel like maybe we could do better because it was all about sheep and fiber and commodities markets. There was no emphasis on local. There was no understanding that local fiber arts and local businesses might be interested in fiber or meat, and I felt like we were really limiting our producers in their markets, but we were also limiting our consumers and our communities to be a part of the farming community and, and the overall community of fiber and meat production in northern Minnesota. And I put together and organized an event similar to that the next year using a mini SARE grant. And from that I gauged, you know, we had over 100 people and I thought, you know, there's interest here in a sustainable sheep community. Uh, we called it the Small Scale Sustainable Sheep Farming Event, and it was very well received. And from that and from surveys handed out, I, I saw that there was a lot of interest, but a lot of misunderstanding or just outright confusion about what 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 about this local? You know, is there a local market? Could we do, be doing better? Could we diversify our markets and our products and have a more stable, and what, what about sustainability and how does that apply? Does that apply to communities, to the environment and farming methods? Uh, what, does that, what does that really mean? And out of that was born the sustainable sheep community, which has now morphed into the sustainable sheep and fiber community of northern Minnesota. And uh, that was something that I, I had started talking with Linda Kingery about, and she has been just a, a Oh, a wealth of knowledge and information, and I know, you know, she just must be on call 24-7 because every time I've had a question, she's been right there to answer it. But uh, the RSDP offers so many opportunities for connecting, and they, they've connected us to other fiber organizations, uh, other fiber and, and meat endeavors people within the University of Minnesota who can help with education, who can help with marketing information, and that is something that has been critical to understanding what the potential of this project is and the, the directions that we want to go. Northern Woolen Mills uh, is in Faustin, was in Faustin, they've recently closed. Stephanie Anderson was the owner, and she had a lot of information that helped us to gauge interest and to give us that ability to know, you know, where can we go from here and what can we do. She told me that she pulled in 29,000 pounds of wool a year from the northern Minnesota area. She had a retail store. She did custom. She also sold uh, wholesale and larger markets around the U.S. 
but one of our biggest problems was creating markets locally. And that's something that uh, the sustainable sheep and fiber community is really passionate about. And as I continue on, I hope that you will see that we have already started creating markets and educational opportunities, and we have plans for the future to continue that. Some of the ways that the RSDP has helped us and other organizations, we've partnered with both the RSDP in the Northwest and Northwest Minnesota Foundation for funding to get this endeavor off the ground. Um, the Center for Rural Entrepreneurial Studies is through the U of M, and they, they set up our website for us. Uh, Rachel Lundbaum did that with a, a grad student, Laura Smith. Uh, the Sustainable Farming Association of Minnesota is our fiscal partner, fiscal agent for our grants, and of course they are just a wealth of information as well, and they are passionate about sustainable farming, which fits right in with our, our stated goals. Uh, Ryan Pesch with the U of M Extension also is working on some market research projects for us, and uh, Becky Harrington is youth education through the U of M, and she's not only provided information and disseminated information, but she has come to events and taught for us and helped pull together things for the 4-H. So those have been really, really helpful to us as an organization, helping pull together people and community. Uh, in addition to these, uh, the NRCS, of course, has been really wonderful to work with. Uh, Thief River Falls, Mark Hayak, the grazing specialist up there, has been just wonderful about promoting and also teaching. And then, of course, we'll have an NRCS specialist come in at our event in February to teach again about forages and sustainable farming methods. The Minnesota Department of Ag, Lisa Wetzel, has been really, really wonderful to work with. She's provided a lot of information for producers who are, are not understanding how might they sell their meat locally, what do they need to do to get that into restaurants, farmers markets, things like that. And, and that's a really tricky thing, of course, because there's a lot of regulations and a lot of misunderstanding. And for a while there, uh, Minnesota regulation had, you know, required inspectors for either USDA or Minnesota same plants. And they were really shy on inspectors. And in this area of northern Minnesota, we don't have options for getting our meat inspected for resale. So that, that's a problem as well, and Lisa's working on that with other people in her office, and she gave quite a bit of information at our last small-scale sustainable sheep farming event about that, and hopefully we'll be back again. Uh, this project is, you know, it's ongoing, and it's changing over time. So we're trying to meet the needs and goals of both the fiber and meat producers and the consumers. So we're working with local businesses, local mills, we're trying to set up relationships. All of this is about connections, connecting with the community, working to support that community while the community works to support us. And that's what this is all about, connections within communities, supporting communities. And that's something that we just have been passionate about. And we found that our communities are passionate about it as well. They're very supportive in all the events that we have held so far very, very excited and enthusiastic about our longer-term goals and projects that we have planned, and the RSDP has just been wonderful about helping us network and connect with that, and I don't think we would have gotten anywhere if we hadn't had that support. Here are our goals at this point for the sustainable sheep and fiber community. We wanted to set up a, a network of producers, which we have succeeded in doing through the website and I will give that information later where you can find that website. Uh, we want to support local fiber artists and crafters with local wool and yarn production. And that's something that we have worked on, and we have a fiber festival coming up. And I'll give you more information about that. That gives vendors and artists a chance to show their wares and sell their wares while at the same time helping consumers be able to buy local and have a source for what they need. We're connecting producers with consumers both through this website that we have planned and events that we hold together educating community and, and producers at the same time. And the website we have great plans for. Right now it's, uh, it's, it's in fledgling stage, but 
Ideally, we want to have producers each have their own page. We'd like to set up a book similar to what fiber sheds do, where each farm can be listed and retail can be listed, and that way larger businesses and individuals and artists can find what they're looking for and support those local farms. Eventually, one of our long-term goals is to set up a teaching farm that has workshop space for educational displays, not a museum, because that, that to me almost sounds static, and we're certainly not static, but where we can do displays, we can have people come in for tours and help them understand not only the tradition of um, wool and, and sheep production in Minnesota, but where is that now, and where is it going to go in the future? Because now it includes much more than just sheep. We have many different fiber animals and people pushing for plant fibers as well. And of course, with Northern Woolen Mills now closed, there's a hole there in our, uh, in our web, and we no longer have a local mill of that size. And one of our long-term goals would be to set up a, a cooperative fiber mill. And here's just a, a snapshot of some of our events that we have done and a little bit of our website, which you can find at sheepcommunity.com. And you can see people interacting. And that's, that's one of the things that we really, really pushed even at our Fiber Festival coming up is we wanted our vendors to offer free demonstrations. We, we're all about education and we want to make it accessible. We're in a rural area and I know the closer you get to the cities, the more you're able to <laughs> charge and expect to receive a, a decent payment for education. And here you certainly can expect some, but we want to make sure that everyone has access, not just the people who can afford that, but the people who can't, so that they have opportunity as well. And so we really, really, really encourage education and, and as much free demonstration as people are willing and able to do. <clears throat> so who we are, uh, our motto is honoring the farming community and the fiber traditions of northern Minnesota. And we hope by doing that that you know we can honor that farming community by remembering where we've been, but also looking toward the future in sustainability and, again, those communities and networking opportunities. We're working to empower producers so that they realize marketing opportunities and they know how to understand what can they do to better improve the marketability of their products. And many producers came into this and said, you know, I didn't know that wool had scales. I didn't know it was insulative. And it, we realized, oh, you kind of have to start at the beginning because many producers raise sheep for the commodities market. They sell the wool to their shearer and there's no step in between, and they didn't realize that they have the potential to diversify and therefore stabilize their farming income because the more that you can find niches and markets for your products, the more diversity you can bring to that farm, the more stable it's going to be. If one of those falls through, you still have other ways that you can sell. But you have to understand what you have, and many of them had no idea fiber artists were interested in their wool, they thought, I guess, it was some exotic wool they wanted. They didn't realize it was just plain old ordinary wool. And they didn't realize that people like lamb. And, you know, you go to Harmony Food Co-op there in Bemidji, and they sell out of lamb for exorbitant prices. They can't get a good lamb supplier in who can meet their needs. And there's a market. There's a market for that here. But we also work to educate consumers to help them understand the importance of supporting their local producers, supporting local businesses, keeping it local, making those connections, and supporting their communities. We work to build relationships, relationships with people, with organizations, with businesses, and with farmers. And therefore, we support communities with all of this. And hopefully we can, you know, continue working. You know, they've started with farmers markets, local vor, eat local, so we want to go on and do more than that. We want to wear local. We want to talk about more than just food and more than just vegetables. We want to talk about a full circle of our products. And by working to empower producers, we have events. Uh, this was actually taken at the 4-H Fiber Fun Day, but we do the small-scale sustainable sheep farming event coming up February 18th, and we have um, speakers and programs that help 
producers to understand how to, one, improve their farming methods and improve their marketing and improve their knowledge about what products they actually have to offer. We work on educating consumers at fiber festivals, even at the 4-H event, articles and information that we provide. We sponsor these educational events throughout the community and throughout the year. And I think for a fledgling organization, we do pretty good. We have three events now throughout the year that we are doing. Uh, the Small Scale Sustainable Sheep Farming event is in February, and this year will be February 18th. The 4-H Fiber Fun Day last May will be repeated again this spring, but we don't have a date set. And the Faustin Fiber Festival comes up the first weekend in October, which would be October 1st and 2nd of this year. And building relationships. Uh, Harmony Food Co-op has their food summit, and that's something, that's one example of a way that we build relationships within the community is to support that and to get information out to our producers about what's, what's, out, what's out there for market through things like this food summit and help people who are interested in, in buying to realize, hey, you know, you can connect with producers up here. Go to the SSFC website, sheepcommunity.com, and you can see producers, where they are, what they have to offer. And supporting communities. And this is something that, you know, our local events support. For one thing, our, I know our Foss and Fiber Festival, we completely filled the uh, Super 8 Motel in Fawson last year. And we supported local businesses. Uh, we always support local businesses for our catering and other needs for our events. Uh, Northern Woolen Mills was hosting quite a few of our events when they were open, which was wonderful. Uh, other than that, the Faustin Civic Center is a good place for us to have events, and there's a church there in Faustin that actually is working with us on event hosting as well. And that's something that we're just completely passionate about. And along with that, we're looking at some long-term projects, including what we're calling the Blanket Project. This originally started because we wanted to create markets for Northern Woolen Mills products and yarns by increasing the value-added products that could be sold. And now that Northern Woolen Mills is no longer there, our goals haven't changed because we want to find products, value-added products for our producers. And one of those could be woven blankets. Everybody needs blankets. And we have local weavers, and we have local yarns, and we have local fiber. We want to pull all of that together to produce blankets for sale, which can go back to support these projects and at the same time provide jobs and opportunities locally. So that's a long-term project that we are working on right now. What you can do to help <laughs> be involved with us, uh, join. We have categories for supporters. We have categories for artisans and artists, and that includes people who knit. Um, even if, if you're not selling at this point, uh, retail, producers, are you a farmer? Do you raise any kind of fiber animals, uh, whether it be angora rabbits or llamas, sheep, anything like that? You know, you're more than welcome. If you're just a supporter because you want to support the project in your local community, we have room for you there. Connect with us. If you have uh, opportunities, if you have organizations that connect in any way, and I immediately thought of the Monarch Project because that's so important with sustainable farming methods to preserve the native plants and the milkweed and, and you know, give areas of your farm over to that. Change when you're haying so that you benefit monarchs as well as other native birds and species that need nesting opportunities. Connect with us on that. How can we help you and how can you help us? Volunteer. We're always needing volunteers at our events to help out. Uh, there's just grunt work, you know. Sometimes it's just taking pictures, using a broom, greeting people at the door, <laughs> counting heads. You know, anything you can do, I, I guarantee you, we could find a job for you. Connect with us and, and learning opportunities. Is there something that you can teach? You can teach us. Is there something that we could teach you and your organization? Uh, do you have something you want to learn? Uh, you want to be a part of our blanket project? Are you a weaver? Do you run a mill? Is there anything that you are interested in and can help us with this or we can help you? 
a teaching farm and education center, that's also something that is a long-term goal for us. So if that's something that you have opportunity, have information, have something you can do to support, by all means, you know, we would absolutely love to have you. Upcoming events, the Foston Fiber Festival, October 1st and 2nd. We actually have a workshop on that Friday, which is September 30th in the evening from 4 to 7 p.m. That's at the Magelson Elementary School in Foston, and um, also some of our classes will be at the church because we haven't quite settled on a good building that works completely for our festival, so that's what we're doing for this year. So that's going to be a wonderful time. We have vendors. We have workshops. We have a fashion show on Saturday evening. By all means, uh, stop on by. It, admission is free. We'd love to have you. Family event, come on out and bring the kids. Small-scale sustainable sheep farming event, February 18th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. We're going to have speakers in education. There will be a lunch, breakout sessions, and this is where we'll be electing new board members for our FC. So if you're interested in serving on the board, come on out. Uh, find out more about that and what you can do to be a part. 4-H Fiber Fun Day, spring, and that's, that's, a, that's a really fun time. We just had a wonderful time with that. We had um, Becky Harrington come out and help the kids learn more about lamb lead and what they could do to improve there. We had uh, Patty Lovegreen come out and teach. She's a fiber artist, and she taught weaving on cardboard. Uh, we had it at the Woolen Mill, so they got a tour of the mill. We taught drop spindles and did natural dye pots and a sheep shearing demo by Byron Johnson, the shearer over by Bemidji. And the kids had a great time, really excited about it. And, if, you know, if you want something to really brighten your day, it's work with kids, you know, to see how excited they get about this stuff. They don't come in. They're, they're so much fun to teach because they don't come in with that misguided attitude of, oh, I don't think I'm going to be very good at this. I tried knitting once and I was terrible. I think I tried a drop spindle once. It didn't work for me. I can't do this. Kids just come in and they... They say, oh, yeah, I'll try that, because they don't care if they can't get it the first time. They don't have that misconception that everybody's going to judge them. They're just excited to try. So they're a lot of fun. And if you ever want to be involved with that, we'll be doing it again. All you have to do is give us a, a call or an email or whatever and let us know, and believe me, we can find some work for you. So you can find us at sheepcommunity.com. Our email is sustainablesheep at gmail.com. And our fiber festival is fostonfiberfestival.com. And uh, thank you again to Rose and the RSDP and also to the people who've helped put this together. And we have a good, good board, enthusiastic board members right now. And I think if there's any questions. Yeah, thank you, Alicia. That is awesome. Uh, I had several comments that say, good work, uh, keep doing what you're doing, and, and People are excited to hear where where the sheep uh, the fiber community goes from here. Um, I was just browsing the the site and looking over the local producers. Um, do you have any retail opportunities for like buying um, buying wool or or meat right now? Yeah, the problem with it is that these people so far we haven't connected to the point that they're on the website. Uh, I think there's a shop in Park Rapids that was selling uh, local Northern Woolen Mills yarn, which of course would be local fibers. And there used to be a yarn shop in Bemidji, but again, that's gone. So it becomes more difficult to make those connections. The Foston Fiber Festival is a great place to show up if you want local yarns because we have a lot of vendors this year selling their products, and that should be a really, really good place. And as for meat right now, no and yes. Harmony Co-op does sell lamb, especially during certain times of the year, but uh, that isn't something that we've done well with just because a lot of our producers haven't figured out how to meet all the regulations and requirements and start marketing it for retail. And I know it's a, it's, I looked into this and it's, it's kind of a, a tedious deal to do. So it's easier if you want lamb to work with your local producer and buy a lamb or half a lamb from him and have him transport that to the butcher for you and then you can just call the butcher and tell him what kind of cuts you want and then you can go pick up your packaged animal. Gotcha. Thank you. 
Um, before we put up forth any more questions, I'm going to start our poll because it's coming up on noon. Um, I will open this up. Uh, if you are logging on on your computer, you can see it there. Um, just answer those two quick questions. I really appreciate it. Um, we did have a clarification from Karen earlier about um, the captive breeding. She was saying that um, that the mass rearing, you know, of thousands of monarchs is more what she was talking about as far as um, it kind of skewing the data uh, or or things like that. But she was saying um, rearing a few in your house, you know, to to learn uh, doesn't cause those sorts of problems. So that's good. Um, my other question for you, Alicia, is um, what would you say is the biggest um, lesson or challenge that you've encountered um, trying to start up this kind of community network for local produce or local production? You know, so far our biggest challenge, because we're, we're such a fledgling community at this point, our biggest challenge right now is to get people to join um, because you know, you have to have something to offer or people aren't going to plunk their money down and join. And that's something that we're we're still working on. And, of course, we're so new that it just hasn't gotten there yet. But that's one of our biggest challenges. And I think our second biggest challenge at this point is going to be Northern Woolen Mills no longer in the picture. So we no longer have a way to have local fibers processed into yarn. And we are working on that. We do have um, information on other local mini mills not local, but local within the northern Minnesota, Wisconsin area, and then also information on, like I said, starting a cooperative mill. So those are some challenges for us. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so just one, one last thing, and then we'll wrap up, I think. We're still getting a few polls in. Um, this is a question for both Alicia and Taryn. Uh, what do you see do you see opportunities for um, immediate connections with the partnerships in the future? Um, just kind of a brief uh, comment about any future collaboration that you see being possible. I can jump in here. Um, I think there are a lot of opportunities for collaboration through the citizen science. Um, that's something that, um, you know, it's, it's really important to sustain sustainability and conservation. It's a really good way to engage the community. So I would love to set up some kind of a citizen science um, coordinated effort. And I, sh I should mention, I didn't say this during my talk, but we don't just do monarchs in our citizen science training here. We have programs working on birds and dragonflies and pollinators and phenology. So um, I, I see that as a real, real opportunity. Are you asking um, about a collaboration between our two, our two projects or just within the community that we're working in or what, what is the question? Um, sorry, let me clarify. Um, I meant, do you see any um, up-and-coming opportunities for the, the regional sustainable development partnerships to collaborate with you um, and others in your community for a project? Well, for us, definitely it would be uh, setting up a cooperative for a fiber mill and uh, for events as well, you know, we're always looking for opportunity for education, and you know, I think that's that's kind of our one of our big goals, and that's something that you know I think could really be facilitated there, especially you know that idea of teaching farm um, hands-on education type thing that we could do more permanently, and and the fiber mill. Awesome. Wonderful. Well, thank you both for all the resources that you've shared and the information. Um, I will post this onto our Facebook page and our website, um, and I'll try to um, pull out some of those crystallized nuggets of information, the links and, and documents that you shared to make those accessible to folks. Um, 
You can find more about our uh, webinar series and tune in for the next one, which is on October 6th um, at 11 a.m. Uh, you can find more information at z.umn.edu slash RSDP webinar. Um, and we hope to hear from you soon. Thank you, presenters, and thank you for attending.